ADHD is often seen as a condition of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. But what if I told you that that's just scratching the surface? What about the emotional world of ADHD? The heightened arousal, the sensitivity to uncertainty, and the anxiety that often follows. Today, we'll explore why ADHD and anxiety are deeply connected and why it matters for understanding and treatment. Let's simplify this together. Welcome to Psychiatry Simplified. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist. If you're interested in all things psychiatry, neuroscience, and mental health related, then this is the channel for you. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to stay in touch with all our future releases. ADHD is more than just a neurodevelopmental condition that affects cognition or behavior. It's a condition that shapes the way individuals perceive and respond to their world. After all, that's what makes us humans. And central to this interaction with the world is anxiety. But why is anxiety so common in ADHD? And what does it tell us about the brain? In order to understand anxiety, we've got to recognize that anxiety as an expression is different from anxiety disorder. Anxiety as a construct is an arousal state that is underpinned by uncertainty. So when we have a certain level of uncertainty, there is an arousal that we interpret as being nervous, being unsure, being uncertain, and the common word used is anxiety. At the heart of ADHD and the arousal mechanisms lies the salience network, a brain network responsible for regulating emotional arousal and identifying what's important in our environment. The word salience is essentially about the stimuli that grab the brain's attention. When this network is dysregulated, Emotional responses are heightened, so arousal is greater. There is sensitivity to uncertainty increases. The prefrontal cortex function, the part of the brain that controls our heightened emotional responses, it's affected. This dysregulation creates a perfect storm for anxiety. It's not just about being inattentive or impulsive. It's about struggling with this uncertainty that can disrupt daily life. Now this anxiety is not all pathological. What tends to happen in treatment is that when we improve cognition and activity, the individual now is able to interact with the rest of the world differently. This of course in the initial stages is a sense of uncertainty. For example, the first time the child has a reduction in their hyperactivity or the first time that they notice that they can engage in those tasks that they weren't able to do. Example, completing their homework, or they find that as assembly, they're sitting still. This is uncertainty. The child doesn't necessarily look at it as good or bad. The good or bad comes from the demands and the expectations from the people around us. So for the child, it's still uncertainty. This can be expressed as a sense of, I'm being, I'm nervous. But for a child, it's expressed as there's something not quite right in my tummy, for example. An adolescent might be able to say, I'm anxious, I'm nervous, I'm not quite sure what's going on. So you can see this expression of uncertainty can be expressed through a range of words, i.e. semantics. In some cases, if this anxiety and uncertainty disrupts our life significantly, through preoccupations or worries, leading to avoidance and autonomic arousal that is resulting in, say, maybe chest pain or headaches or tension or insomnia. That's when now we have the construct of an anxiety disorder. So the big question is, what is the risk of an anxiety disorder in ADHD? Let's look at the data. Now, this study looked at individuals from 16 years onwards. So essentially, they looked at individuals within sort of the childhood and adolescent period and then followed them from 16 years onwards. What they found was that individuals with ADHD are 23 times more likely to develop bipolar disorder compared to those without ADHD. Add anxiety to ADHD and the risk increases 30 fold. This tells us something crucial. ADHD and anxiety often go hand in hand, and together 
they can significantly increase the risk of mood disorders like bipolar disorder. And that's the reason why it becomes so important to look at the emotional part of the brain in ADHD. So let's think about how this links to treatment. ADHD treatment typically focuses on improving cognition and behavior, essentially focusing on the frontostriatal circuits. Here, dopaminergic and noradrenergic potentiation makes a difference. Of course, we sometimes use non-stimulants to do the same. This helps individuals focus, stay organized, or control impulses. But here's what often happens. Once these symptoms are managed, the emotional dimensions of ADHD, like heightened arousal or a persistent fight or flight response emerge. Patients may say, I can focus better now, but I feel more nervous. This emotional unmasking can be particularly overwhelming for adolescents and children who are already navigating the uncertainty of development. Clinicians can learn this in our ADHD curriculum. This is a 19 and a half our comprehensive curriculum that takes you through the neuroscience and connects it to phenomenology, then to neurobiology, to pharmacology, along with the psychological principles. You can visit academy.psychscene.com to explore this further. So what we recognize is that the emotional part of the brain is really important. One manifestation is in the form of a cognitive expression of anxiety saying, I'm anxious or I feel anxious. But the other part of emotional arousal that can be missed is hyperactivity. When we think about hyperactivity, we often picture fidgeting or restlessness, the overt manifestation of hyperactivity. But hyperactivity isn't just physical. It can also be internal. For some, it manifests as cognitive hyperactivity in the form of overthinking or ruminative thinking. I've covered the video on overthinking here, so this explains the neurobiology in more detail. For others, it can show up as a constant worry internally, but it may simply be an uncomfortable internal restlessness. This internal hyperactivity is commonly found in females, and this is the reason why ADHD, especially in females, is often misdiagnosed as anxiety. Now here's where it gets even more interesting. Treating ADHD's core symptoms like inattention, impulsivity can sometimes reveal this underlying emotional uncertainty. Now while a certain level of arousal is necessary for functioning, it can become overwhelming if we can't control it, which means if left unregulated. This is why some individuals develop a separate anxiety disorder even after their ADHD symptoms improve. This can happen either because of the stimulant that increases the arousal, which is expressed as anxiety or an internal restlessness or internal arousal, but it can also happen due to psychological reasons where the emotional regulatory mechanisms are unable to resolve the uncertainty or the external demands that result in that uncertainty. So this is where children, adolescents, and adults alike require help, psychological strategies to sometimes deal with that uncertainty. So we've got to recognize that we often treat ADHD through a narrow lens, addressing cognition and behavior. But this approach misses the bigger picture. ADHD is intertwined with emotional dynamics. If we ignore these emotional dimensions, we miss an opportunity to address symptoms like anxiety and mood instability, which are often a natural part of the ADHD experience. So what's the message here? ADHD isn't just about hyperactivity or inattention. It's about how the brain processes emotions, arousal, and uncertainty. Because in order to meet our needs, in order to engage in tasks consistently, in order to engage in relationships, in order to focus on the key functions for functional recovery, the relationships, the vocation, the financial management, we require optimum emotional regulation. Anxiety is not an add-on, it's an integral part of the ADHD story. And uncertainty or anxiety is not always pathological. In fact, when anxiety arises as part of ADHD treatment, it is important for us to dissect it, to deconstruct it, to understand where this anxiety arises from. Is it biological 
or is it arising as a natural part of uncertainty where we need to now examine the external demands and help the individual resolve this uncertainty? Recognizing this connection can make all the difference in treatment and outcomes. And it becomes very, very important to make this a priority in children and adolescents because this phase of development is punctuated by uncertainty. They are exposed to thousands of stimuli and many of these stimuli require caregivers to help adolescents and children resolve this uncertainty. Children and adolescents need support of teachers or doctors or psychologists, depending on the severity, to provide the emotional regulation capabilities. This is where we need to provide the curiosity about the individual's emotional world. Remember, ADHD does not exist in isolation. To truly support individuals, we need to understand the full spectrum, cognition, behavior, and emotion. This is where the real transformation happens because ultimately ADHD is a lifespan condition and we want to help the individual and support the individual across the lifespan. So I hope that you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. A big thank you to all of you for supporting this channel. Let me know in the comment section what you think about ADHD and anxiety. I look forward to seeing you in another video soon. Until then, stay curious. Bye-bye.